question, something that we've done a lot of in the past, and it's always such a rich experience for me, I have to say. And we talked, we, we discussed um, what, what, how we would frame tonight, and Gretchen came up with this idea of time returning. And I wondered if we just start, Gretchen, by you drawing that title out a little bit about why we came up with that idea. Uh, well, uh, it was really to do with um, working towards the exhibition that I had at Two Rooms, which is still hanging on the walls of uh, the gallery, but in darkness, of course, because uh, it was truncated by COVID-19 lockdown. And that exhibition is looking back at work done in 1988, 1989, uh, linked to my first show in London with Jenny Todd Gallery, which is um, was collages and painting. And so we were looking back this year at uh, 1988, 1989, and talking about what was happening now in my studio in 2020 and bringing those two things together because process links both, both those periods. In fact, process is how I make my paintings. So time returning is uh, about the past and the present and what the work shares uh, in terms of how it's made. And it's a very interesting metaphor as well for the present situation, because what so many people have said to me is that time has seemed different under lockdown, that you have time to reflect in a way that you wouldn't in uh, your everyday working life, because we're all just um, we're all just so busy. So we're going to start this evening by look, we're looking at three groups of works and we're going to start by looking at Gretchen's collages and um, talk about the kind of process over time that has been involved in their making. So Gretchen, you said to me first of all that uh, you know you started this whole series that look at the pink and white terraces as a result of looking at Blomfield's paintings. Yes, well um, Charles Blomfield and uh, others painted a number of paintings of the pink and white terraces before Mount Tarawera blew them up. And uh, in fact, Charles Blomfield probably did, I don't know, 10, 15 yeah. of these paintings. Yes. I noticed that in the Webb's catalogue for photography, the Burton yes. brothers have got an extraordinarily beautiful black and white photograph of the terraces these great big sweeping basins of calcite uh, edged liquid spilling over to the next basin. Um, I was aware of Blomfield years ago as a student at, at, in art history in the 60s, but um, I don't know why, I, it's too far back for me to remember what popped into my mind in 1988, but I started to, to look again and the very first collages were based on, uh, they're very small. This pink terrace is to the right of the Blomfield. is tiny. It's, you know, little like that. Uh, and it's a little study looking at the rim, of, perhaps, of uh, one of the basins that formed the terraces going down the hill. And from these little studies, Big works grow, of course. And, so, and, and was this the was this the first time you'd ever done collages, or had you done them in the no, past? No, I've always done collage. Um, collage was something that was taught to me as a secondary school student, and throughout my life as a painter, I have used collage. Some of the earliest were included in my first retrospective in 1986 at the Sargent, where I glued fabric onto paper and did still lives. Um, so if anybody's got After Nature catalogue from that year, they'll see those early works done in the 60s, mid to late 60s. 
So I've always loved collage as a way of taking an idea and creating out of shards, pieces, a whole again, a bit like gluing together a broken pot. Um, it's the same but different and it produces its own qualities mm. which you can see um, clearly in, in these two works. Um, oh, that's not the big pink. No, no, this is, this, these are the interim ones, the smaller ones, before oh. we get to the big work. Well, Ashen Terraces is huge. That's two and a half metres almost by one point one and a half high, but um, there was a big one called Pink Terraces as well that we had up earlier in the day and it's disappeared, but uh, anyway. I don't uh, know where that's gone. No, Ashen Terraces, which uh, is this jump from the little wee pink terraces to, to a big, not multiple sheets of paper. Here were, I think, four sheets of paper pinned up on the studio wall and painted quite freely so that they gravity runs the colours down and intermingles with the next thing, a bit like the spillage of water over the edge of the pink and white terraces. Mm. So I was trying to create a sense of flowing down and gravity fed at the same time as the calligraphic gesture of loops that define the edges of things. Um, and it's like drawing and paint. And I might do three or four uh, works on the wall like that, take them off and then start to reconstruct by cutting and getting edges and stops and starts. And you'll see the red bar with a little bit of green at the bottom on mm. the left hand side that's glued on on top. Uh, the same with the red bar coming down from the top on the right. Uh, edges of paper can be seen quite clearly. And the other thing about working on this big scale is that I can create an airiness, a, a sense of kind of dribbles within an airy, spacious atmosphere. But and there's also a random quality to it, isn't it? Because the drips control themselves. You don't control the drips. No, but they... I choose I choose the pieces of collage that I want and glue them onto a big clean set of white paper on the wall. So the randomness is definitely there and is part of the making of the image but it's very controlled mm. in that I select that piece yeah. or that piece or, you know, some other piece and reconstruct with the artifice of making an artwork the pieces that I want mm. to have the most expressive nature for talking about my subject. And I imagine that with each piece it differs as to how easily it goes together or how long you ponder trying different juxtapositions before you feel you've got it absolutely right. Yes, there's a, you know, there's a lot at play, of course, like there is in any painting. Um, there, although there's the verticality of the runs of the paint uh, and its gouache, uh, there's a horizontalness too which spreads across the width of the paper. So there are two, there's both gravity and there's the stretching out. So the control that I force upon the making of the work is my scissors cutting what I want and gluing where I want. Mm. And for me anyway, optically, when I look at it, it's as if, the drips are like a veil that you look through and then you have the solidity of the horizontals. Um, it, for me, I and mean, I'm sure other people might see it differently, but apart from where you've collaged the piece on, it's very much this wonderful sense of looking through into other colour. Mm. Through those. The colours are particularly um, 
although I obviously started off with the idea of pink terraces, because we carry, I mean, we can't see these pink and white terraces, you know, we, we weren't alive when they were blown up. But we do know that um, the, the rims of the, of the basins were calcite, white and greys and pinks and, and the luminosity of the blue with the water sitting in it. Sometimes that was, you know, a, a more murky than others. Sometimes a white with its sort of gaseousness mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you're allow you're allowed to invent your own pink and white mm -hmm. terraces. Uh, and I like that. I like to start from something uh, that might have its roots in the real world, and then it grows into mm -hmm. my world yeah. up here. And the, for those people who saw the exhibition at Two Rooms, I mean, this this work just bowled me over because of its sheer scale. Um, and uh, so uh, talk to me a little bit about what lay behind this particular grouping of collage. Right. Well, the, this one just kept on growing. And, it, you know, it got to almost five metres long which is the length of the painting behind me. And I ran out of wall space. That's six sheets of the biggest uh, <laughs> handmade paper that I could buy at the time um, with collage glued over that. And at the Two Rooms exhibition, we just pinned it up on the wall. So it was very raw, mm -hmm. presented how I had it when I did it in the studio in 1988. And it's taking quite deliberately these semicircular forms mm -hmm. that uh, climb or drop, drop down from the top or climb up from the bottom and the gravity of the, the dribbles coming down. There's a touch of green and red in the top left, which we know that uh, these basins, um, the terraces, were surrounded by bush. And we know that when the eruption happened, all that bush got blasted away and burnt. And uh, little villages got covered in ash and there were blackened trees. So the right hand side is the sort of residue of the smoke and the ash and the and it suggests for me mm. these colors suggest the whole the whole thing the, the the cataclysm that happened the the state of the terraces before but it's it's an invention mm. it, uh, the thing about collage is that it's the perfect example to talk about the artifice of art mm. you know i'm not trying to do a photographic copy of something. Uh, I am trying to invent a new, a new thing, a new object, a new experience. So I'm trying to bring in with my colors and my movement, and my gesture and uh, everything, my invention of the terraces and the stops and the starts are very deliberate in here. You can see quite sharp cut off pieces of paper, uh, sharp glues in, the red and the green and the ochre are not allowed to go below uh, a certain line. The green dribbles down, but that's a cluster there. It's very much a composition composed in the studio out of pre-painted pieces of paper and I'm inventing as I go. Mm. Well now the next um, group of paintings we're looking at are quite different in their process and it, well not so much in their process but in their source, their derivation and um, we've you know both of us have really love the painting of Goya, he's such a painterly person but the two that we're going to talk about tonight are very your very specific responses to portraits. And um, what's so curious about the little Infante is that, of course, he's unfinished. So would you like to talk us through that? Yes. 
Well, um, I love Spanish painting, and the two greats of Spanish painting are Velázquez and Goya. And Goya would look back at Velázquez's painting and and learn from it. He thought he he thought Velázquez was one of the greats, the great, the greatest. Uh, I was delighted to read in my book on Goya, which is called Order, Disorder, Order and Disorder, I was delighted to read that Goya primed his canvases before painting. The underpainting was done in a reddish brown. And the little boy, the little Infante here, his trousers are still the, the ground, the underpainting of the ground. And I was looking at, in particular, I was looking at uh, his paintings of, of women, Goya's paintings of women, but there was the ground that I particularly love to use in the last 18 months. I've often used an ochery red, brown, brownish red ground to, to do my own, my, my paintings on, staining it into the Belgian linen or into the white canvas. So my hemisphere, takes its cues from Goya's painting. The underpainting, which you can see in mine, uh, is an ochery reddish brown. Uh, the, the blouse that the boy is wearing, um, part of his sash, has that silver white, the silvery white, the beautiful gray background behind mm. him is the gray background on top of my reddish ochery ground, which gives me my underpainting. You can also see it underneath the black on the left-hand side. The little splash of pink on the Infante's waistband. There's a little sliver of geometry running along the bottom edge of the painting. Uh, it's about 10 mils wide. And there's a wider band uh, of orangey on top of the ochre under the black side and those sliding geometries which allow me to bring in a geometric form into the painting like a ledge for you to step over so you go into the painting over this and it also echoes Goya's colours as mm. well. So and it's that, a sort of anchoring device. It's, yeah, it's an anchoring device. It obviously for me, and now I've explained it to you, I, I have a private reference back into that painting, uh, which gives me an extra voice, an extra note of color, which mm. I loved. Um, and the painting comes about through my own painting and my own baggage and history of my own hemispheres, but speaking to the Goya painting. And there's a lovely synergy to me because his painting is actually, because it's unfinished, it seems very gestural. You know, he yeah. hasn't defined some of the areas. They seem, you've got these quite broad swathes of, um, of, of colour on the uh, right on his side, you know, that deep sort of almost blackish colour and then the blue below and then the uh, deep burnt umber below it. Um, but also too, the way in which he's deliberately made the light seem to emanate out from behind the little boy, you know, and that's, that, that's that, right. And that it, impish, mm, that impish face. It glows, doesn't it? The grey glows through and uh, I mean, I didn't, I deliberately did not choose to use the red of his jacket or the blue behind the white on his sash. There were too many colors mm. for me. I reduced down and took what I wanted, took what I needed. I'm not beholden to the painting. No. I am receiving what I want from it mm. to make my own. But the lovely thing for people coming to it from the outside is it adds another meaning to your painting yes. to understand where the painting has come from, I feel. And the same very much applies to the next work by Goya, uh, which is mm. a fantastic portrait. Mm. I discovered today there's a second one in the Hermitage, which is quite different. I think, 
Yeah, I, f I only found it late this afternoon. Uh, but this is this. What drew you to this particular painting? Well, every time we travel, my husband James and I travel. I make a beeline for the postcard section of the art book, the the you know the sales room, and I collect postcards that I want to live with at home. I can't take the paintings out of the gallery, but I can have a reference in the uh, postcards. And I must have picked up um, this Goya when we were in Ireland, which was some <laughs> decades ago now. And I've had it pinned up in my studio ever since. But you know, so often you don't see things and you really need to see them. And I'd ignored this for like, uh, I think we traveled an island in the 90s. And I'd ignored it for ages, but it's been there, clipped onto my in tray. Uh, and suddenly one day I looked at it and I thought, my God, what a beautiful, beautiful painting. And I thought, I'm going to look at Goya's portraits of women. And he's done some amazing portraits of mm. women. And so I kick-started off my Donna paintings with this one, taking, again, as I've just explained about the Infante, uh, cues from his palette of colour. And, of course, the sumptuous satin brocade sofa that he's put Antonia on is this lovely yellow, and there's almost a kind of greenish yellow with the shadowness of the fabric. And that greenish yellow is even uh, darker and more uh, khaki or sludgy greys in behind her in the top half. And then this incredible central form in black with her, her uh, fingerless gloves of white and her ivory fan. So I set about priming my uh, painting with the undercolour that Goya uses, the reddish brown, and then I gave the sofa, the brocade fabric colour to my right hand side, and I gave her dress and her mantilla to my left hand side, and I wanted the hemisphere to have the left talking to the right, making a complete whole. And again, I introduced the sliver of geometry representing her white gloves or her white flesh, whatever, or her ivory fan along the bottom left and a sliver of yellow, really to pull that yellow over into the black side mm. with this narrow geometry coming across in front of the the grey, the, the white geometry. And then I had my own Donna Antonia. Now she was, um, she died in her early 40s. That was a painting done two years before she died. And she was a performer, an actress, and had apparently a lovely voice and would sing. And all of that sort of incredible uh, vitality, which is kind of this amazing cameo of a face. Mm -hmm. You have, you wouldn't know she was a singer or a performer, but she is a very strong personality. I also loved the way he broke his background up into two quite clear parts: the the sofa she's sitting on and the wall above her. And I just thought, right, I'll. I'll tip that. There's my two quadrants mm. bringing together. Mm. Um, uh, these are little things that help me make my painting that Goya gives me. <laughs> of course, you know, I'm interpreting it as I feel like. Uh, and again, uh, the cues are there for me to take or not take. Mm. And there's, with, as far as your geometries are concerned, because these are a vital element of so many of your paintings, uh, these are, uh, is it almost like a collage when you add that in? Yes, they're added at the end and I have a lot of strips of paper that I paint in different colours and in different widths and different thicknesses. Um, these have appeared in the hemispheres, uh, I can't remember when they first came in, 
But the first, the original hemispheres from 1981 to 1990s didn't have them at all. It was only when the ovals started to introduce geometries in them that I could see what they were doing in the ovals. And I tried them in the hemispheres and I found I could talk about the same way of stepping into the painting using this in contrast to the surging movement of the paint being pushed around. Mm -hmm. And I like that. A static mm -hmm. elements, but they have a they perform a certain part of the painting. And I think that's always so fascinating with a painting when you think, well, if I took that bit away, it wouldn't be as strong. You know, well, any kind of any painting, this is every element is thought about and added because it brings something to the final composition. That's true. That's true. I mean, um, sometimes I don't put in geometries uh, and I have done six little studies uh, uh, during the course of the lockdown as well as the big painting and two don't have geometries mm -hmm. in them. They didn't, they said we don't want them in this. So, you know, I don't have to put them in. And if the painting is telling me what it needs, then I'll go with that. Mm. Right, now the last uh, group of, the last work we're going to talk about has come through quite a long process, hasn't it? This is something, a theme that you've been looking at for a period of time. Yes. And uh, it's really fascinating in relation to uh, process because you start with these handwritten notes and I've typed them out on the left because I just thought it would save people, make it easy for them to read straight away. But the, 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 the hours of the day or the book of hours are really very, perhaps the most important early books for European women, at least, aren't they? They are. They are. I, I love the idea of sets of things. Um, like years ago when I had my survey show at the Auckland Art Gallery, uh, there was a room devoted to the seasonal project, the seasons, the four seasons, spring, autumn, summer, winter, and they were specifically designed to go into a room. And then um, I did The Seven Sorrows of Mary, uh, which uh, was in its own special room, seven big black ovals around with following the the what the seven sorrows were all about with geometric forms. And this is another set, the eight canonical hours, which started in medieval times. And years ago, we visited Provence and France and looked at three amazing 11th, 12th and 13th century Cistercian abbeys. Uh, and they're very austere, these abbeys. No stained glass, no sculptures, no, no ornamentation. Uh, the rigour, uh, it really appealed to me. And the, the 24 hours are marked by these particular divisions of time. And uh, I just started to, I, I started to reread about this uh, last year and at the beginning of this year, I asked my brother who makes all my stretches, could you make me eight uh, semicircular, no divisions, no quadrants, just eight semicircular uh, stretches? I want to do the eight canonical hours. Uh, I have done four so far, and uh, one and a half meters high and three meters wide, or four meters wide and two meters high. Anyway, um, no, they're not four metres high. Anyway, they're, they're, they are what they are. can't remember their size. And I've done four and I've got another four to go. And eventually, we'll gather them together and we'll find a place and we'll show them mm. uh, all together. Uh, they've gone off to various... There were two at... Uh, there were two two rooms exhibition last year. Was it last year, Jenny, or this year? Last year, I think. Anyway, we, um, I have this idea that they will form their own little book. I'll publish them in 
print them in a little book, just like a book of hours. So each, each hour will be a contemplation hour where you can uh, ruminate and think about things mm. and, and meditate. Uh, well, the, the other thing that fascinated me was you not only sort of wrote them out to yourself, thinking about what each of these titles, to say sex, non a Vespers, etc., mean to you, but then on the, ne the opposite page of your sketchbook, you haven't done any drawings. You simply, and I love this because it was what Frances Hodgkins used to often do on top of her sketches, you've written the colour notes that will be the, the trigger for you mm. developing on the final work. Mm. Yes, well, that's what I thought uh, when I was writing them out. Now, how would I, how would I start? What would I start with? What colours would I start with? And as I said to you, Mary, the other day, um, I'm not going to be dictated to by what I've written. If I pour onto the canvas, and of course, my stretches are lying on their back on the floor of my studio, if I pour on a yellow or an orange or a pink and it doesn't feel right, I'll alter that. Um, even if I've written in the book orange and yellow, uh, it, it could get altered. And in mm. fact, the whole process of <laughs> the painting, painting for me being a process that it happens as the paint mm. is being moved around. But and there has to be a starting point. Yeah, it's always it's, got to be a starting point. Yeah. So and, and sometimes, um, uh, and my floor is witness to this, I'll be kind of hung up on purples and blues. Uh, and then another time I might have discovered whites and greys and the layers of the palimpsest of the floor or palimpsest of the floor uh, tells you where I've been in, in, a, in a series of paintings. Mm. Well, this, this is um, the image that is behind you, but I, and it shows the floor, which of course I always find absolutely fascinating. But could you just do your party trick now and get up and go back so people can see the size of the painting? Yes. Right. Because Mary, we might on my screen we might need you to um oh, right. okay. unshare yeah. the screen. Yes, okay, so great okay, Gretchen, if you come forward again now. Okay. Because then we can hear you. So so long oh. as you're talking, if you sit well now talk about it, but what well, I wanted you to do that because people look at an image on a slide and they don't get any sense of scale. If I if I um, if I talk loudly and I walk to the painting and pace it out, yep. I'll do that. Yep. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> it's actually five meters long by two and a half meters high. It is huge. And now I've finished it. I want to wrap it up and get it out because uh, I need to concentrate on my next lot of painting. But this is what I focused on throughout the four weeks level, alert level four. And, and so, so this is a response to and a development on from an, a work called Lords, isn't it? Which That's came right. from the canonical hours. Yes, I, um, I, had the stretcher spare, it's the same size as the Aetia Roa cloud that Auckland Art Gallery owns and in the Shower of Gold that Te Papa owns, has in their collection. And I got it into the studio and I felt that I wanted to revisit the idea of the coming of the light, which is actually the what Lords L A U D S is about in the canonical hours, um, and and this one's ended up. Uh, my husband James says more like a Hokusai wave uh, of the white surge coming up and over out of the depths of the darkness. Could be water. It could be just night. Pushing away 
on, on the right hand side, the blackness of night. Mm. Um, in the flesh, when you're looking at this painting, there's a big waving, uh, rhythmical movement of black paint, which is being pushed back by the white coming over, jumping across the join and forcing its way into the right hand quadrant. Um, and then there's this horizon line that starts with blue and then slightly thicker blue and then the pink, almost as though there's a crack of dawn coming at the same time, which is, of course, Lords is celebrating the end of night and the beginning of the day. Uh, and there's a sort of dark band running along the bottom, which is, has got um, uh, submerged imagery in it, uh, painting, painting underneath the, the layers that you can see through. And there's a lot of pink under the white you might not be able to see that you in your detail, on the, um, i can see it on the screen on my on the big work here mm. but i think that's one of the things that always fascinates me is when you see your paintings in the flesh you get this tremendous sense of depth because of the way in which you've layered the colors um i can I, oh suddenly there's a red line appeared on my screen yeah but, I don't know how, who's done that. I don't know how that's <laughs> happened. Somebody's drawing on this. <laughs> but anyway, it's certainly, there's certainly no orange in the paint. That's most bizarre. Yes. But um, because of the horizontal that you put in, you know, you that also helps for me anyway to draw me into depth. And yet there's this, so that the wave, or if it is the water or spray, also is rippling towards me. And that sort of stroke that's, on the that on the left hand side below the geometrical horizon yes. and it's incredibly effective yes. um, and very powerful yes um the process of the painting of this is many many layers of course i start out with a uh, an underpainting of um maybe pale violet gesture you can some sort of see Two thirds of the way down on the on the black side, some violet movement coming in, mm. uh, and then there's pink under the white, and then there's the white, uh, and here. there's purple under the black. There's many mm. many layers, and because it's now co it's called wave light breaks, and it is light breaking the darkness um, coming up out of those bottom depths into yeah. into the hemisphere. So the gesture, when I talk about process and I talked about the uh, collages and the use of gravity because the paper was pinned on the wall, here with the paint on the, the stretcher on its back on the floor, I can't paint it vertically or it'll all run down. Um, I'm scooting around the form, the, the curving form, using my brush and my squeegee to kind of rhythmically echo the structure of the support so that I'm making a painting through that process that also talks about its geometry mm -hmm. in an organic, uh, fluid way. Mm, it's very, very beautiful. Now, I'm aware that we're um, probably running out of time. So is there any last thing you want to say or shall we open up for questions? Oh, open up. I've talked too much. Well, I think it's been absolutely fantastic. So I'll just get rid of the screen <laughs> and then, Penny, you can be in control of the questions. Yeah, so um, we've got a question from Jenny Todd. So I'm just trying to unmute you, Jenny, or you can unmute yourself if you can find that. Yeah. Are you there, Jenny? Yeah. Hi. Um, Gretchen, there has been, um, Mary didn't really touch on the, the, the hemispheres. You have returned very dramatically and fabulously to the hemisphere form, which you haven't really used for many years, and suddenly there they are. And uh, uh, could you mm. why hemisphere and not, why don't these don't work so the same on a rectangle? Yes, well, um, 
I'm trying to juggle both the rectangles and their combinations and the hemispheres. I don't know why the hemispheres have become so dominating in my mind. Um, you know, for some, for some years, I'd only do two or three a year. Uh, and then suddenly there's this sort of big pull in me to, I don't know why, Jenny, um, but the rectangular form feels satisfying, especially when I'm joining it to another rectangular form and allows me to speak in a different way to what I do when I'm doing the hemisphere. But the hemispheres somehow uh, come to the fore again. And, you know, that may be that in five years' time, the oval may come forth. Uh, I've still got oval stretches that I have yet to work on in the studio and in, in the carport. Uh, so those are the three forms that I have used all my painting life since 80, since the 80s. Um, no, not one real reason, uh, perhaps just a desire to, to swing from one shape to another and then back again. I, I, from my perspective, I think that the hem when you use the hemispheres, you can convey a lot more drama so that then the, the rectangles are still and the hemispheres seem to be really full of life and drama. Yes. Yes, well, that's certainly true. And the one behind me is full of drama. Um, I also, for some reason, uh, it's very satisfying form for me to work on. I like the curve, but I love architecture. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the connotations that it carries is is filling me up now. Thank you, Gretchen. And we have a question also from Sue Gardner. I've, um... Where is Sue? Sorry, Sue, I'm having trouble unmuting you. Are you, allow, are you able to unmute yourself? Here we are. Hi, Hi Gretchen. Look, Hi. it was more of a comment rather than a question, if that's all right. But... It was just that when you were talking about your large painting behind you, Wave, and you mentioned about uh, alert level four, and the words alert level just seemed to make something go off in my brain when I was thinking about the role of your horizontal geometry. And the, the, the idea of being alert seems to be partly in my mind the role of one of those horizontal uh, geometries, as you call them, because they they are making you visually alert. It, it sort of holds you in a moment of focus. Uh, and then that is then thrown into contrast by the kind of dreamy sense of, of time kind of flowing, uh, time returning, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the other part of the painting. Um, and so I just felt that um, it was a way of thinking about um, time and this kind of dreaminess that sometimes we're in during, during these different alert levels, a kind of sleeping and, <clears throat> and awaking moments, that kind of duality of, of time, held together by the alertness of that visual focus. So I just yeah. thought it was a nice thing to think, think about alert levels with that painting. Yeah. The other thing I was just thinking on about in relation to what Jenny says is that architecturally, the um, lunette or the arch is, it, it, not always, but is often a portal it's either a window or it's a, you know, two columns moving through a door or it's a line of arches moving down the nave of a church. So mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. passage through time in a literal architectural sense. And I often get that sense when I'm looking at your uh, ovals and your lunettes as well, that they're portals. Mm -hmm. this, this, yeah. Yes, well, when I discovered the hemisphere, um, and that was when I was the Francis Hodgkins Fellow in 1981 in Dunedin, I um, had got my father to make me uh, some quadrants up. And I had the year before put two, four 
squares together to and two squares together and had drawn within those a curved line. One made a great big circle and the others made a semicircle within two squares. And when I looked at those paintings at the end of 1980 before I moved to Dunedin, I thought, I don't need those corners. They were redundant. Um, it was this form uh, that I really was interested in. I just sort of filled those corners up. So I said to my father, could you make me up, you know, four, uh, eight quadrants to make up four hemispheres and ship them down to Dunedin for me when you've made them, which he did do. And that was how the hemisphere came about. And it was finding it within my own work, but not seeing it at the time, but stripping mm. the, to the essential. And, you know, this is, this is how things happen. It's there, you just need to see it. Mm -hmm. So that might just be a lovely note for us to end on. Gretchen and Mary, thank you so much. It's just wonderful love. We could listen to you for hours, actually. Um, Gretchen, we so enjoyed coming to your studio, and so it's very nice for me to imagine where you're sitting right now. And the yeah. airport, <laughs> that beautiful painting is sitting behind you. Mm. Um, thank you for the lovely talk. Um, thank you to everyone else who's joined us tonight. Um, we have next week our cocktail chats is with Anna Tonga and Sue Garden is going to be talking with her. So Anna is the new Pacific Arts Curator at Auckland Art Gallery who's supported by the Foundation. Oh, so, great. Thank you, everyone. It's been lovely and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Gretchen. Okay, Mary. I'll just try and turn my thing off now.